I'm very pleased to be here to remember the great achievement of Clement Attlee's Labour government in 1945, where we took the great uh, um, utilities, uh, the mines, the railways, into public ownership. We've done it before and we can do it again. We need to remember our history and we need to remember its lessons. And this time, we'll not only do it, we'll go further. Because capitalism, the rotten system that we live under, has gone further and the exploitation is much worse. So we not only have to do it again, we've got to do it better. But sure we can. I'm Deborah Burton and I run a small organisation called Tipping Point North South and we work in cinema documentaries, one-off events and single issue campaigning and this Atlee Remembered Weekend is under something we call Atlee Nation and it's, it's our newest project. I just want to give a little <coughs> few words of context in terms of Atlee and now. So between 1945 and 1951, Atlee's government saw the creation of the National Health Service we know, the building of one million homes, a thousand new schools, 25,000 teachers, new teachers, the introduction of fair wage and employment conditions, child benefit, disability benefit, social insurance, sickness pay, maternity pay, national parks, and the discovery for me was legal aid. I didn't know that legal aid came in under the Atlee government. That's not to mention the nationalisation, the public ownership programme that took place at the same time, all in five and a half years. And for us, there's a really important little piece of information out there. Uh, in 2004, Mori and Leeds University polled 139 political historians, social historians, and to rank in the 20th century the greatest prime minister. And over Churchill, over Thatcher, it was Attlee. And in 1994, Labour elected something fundamentally different as its leader from what it had had, from what it had always had. It had before several leaders who grew pretty disenchanted with what I like to call Labour England. The Labour of the trade unions, the Workers' Educational Association, all of those things. All of its leaders, some of them have become very, very fed up with it. Ramsay MacDonald in particular became very fed up with it. But they all knew it, they understood it, they'd been brought up with it. In 1994, for the very first time, Labour elected a leader who didn't know what it looked like. And that, I think, is at the root of the failure of Tony Blair's 1997 government, that he didn't understand the ground from which his party sprang. People ask me sometimes, is Jeremy Corbyn a Clem Attlee figure? No. No, he isn't. He isn't a Clem Attlee. It, that doesn't mean that we can't hope that he's not going to run a government that could end up perhaps with the same sort of record of achievement as Clem Attlee's government. What he has in common with Clem Attlee is a clarity of purpose. What he wants to achieve, the, why he is in politics, and, and I suppose it's the difference between somebody who is in politics to be something and somebody who is in politics to do something. Mm -hmm. And what he has in common with Clem Attlee is that he is not in politics to be something, but he seems to me to be in, somebody who is in politics in order to do something. Clem Attlee, 1956. This is from your, one of your pieces on Clem Attlee. 1956, there was a statue of Keir Hardy placed in the House of Commons, and Attlee said, Mr Speaker, I think this is the first time that, that a bust has been placed in the House of Commons of a member of the working class. Hardy was not only born of the working class, he remained of the working class. And Attlee added, you say, Few members of Parliament had a greater effect upon the House of Commons than Keir Hardy. Okay, discuss. Yeah, <laughs> I have not prepared a peroration, no. but I will make a few comments. <coughs> I, a, a few thoughts arising from what Francis said. It was very interesting, I know why you did. You started with Ramsay MacDonald, who actually in a way is the absolute antithesis of what we're generally looking at in Labour leaders. Then as you were talking, I was thinking about the differences and connections between Keir Hardy, Attlee and Jeremy Corbyn. I think you're absolutely right that I think what, what unites them all is a moral purpose and, and 
being in politics for what I would call the right, or the left in their case, reasons. I think what's absolutely true, though, is that Attlee was a fixer, not of a, not of a Wilson Callaghan kind, but he was an intensely pragmatic man <coughs> who also, and I think we have to say this before I go back to Keir Hardy, I think the significance of Attlee, you can't look at his premiership without taking into account the Second World War. You know, somebody has said now about Jeremy Corbyn and what kind of a prime minister he would be, that one of the things that will go against, that will make it hard for him, is that usually if you want to make major change, it either follows the collapse of the state, violent revolution, a mm. world war, and I've forgotten what, oh, um, uh, a pandemic. Uh, a spread of diseases. Mm. You know, so in other words, emergencies mm. help foster radicalism. Mm. And I think that, that Attlee is very interesting because he was that sort of pragmatic, minimalist man coming at a time of national emergency mm. and that that, that that created an alchemy that then created the 45 to, to 51 government. Sense of, uh, or the reality, the pragmatic reality of a moment of crisis. Yeah. And for precisely the reason, I mean, you would, we, when you were looking at those moments of Isbahadi and then the Attlee, that Attlee post-war moment, and then now, in relation to Corbyn, and I think as we sit here reflecting on the fact, let's remember what the membership figures of the Labour Party were just a few years ago, and then let's think about what they are now, not only as the, the you know, what are, is it roughly about 600,000? 600, you know, yeah. But just thinking about where that, where, where the where the fortunes uh, of the party <coughs> stand at the moment, but this, but I think it is a mo I think it is a moment of crisis for all the reasons mm -hmm. that you identify. Austerity, yeah, yeah. So it's austerity. I think the consequences of two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, we've barely found a language for yet. So mm. this this slide, and the collapse of the markets and the impact that it's having, the loss of confidence, the very real rise of fascism in the right mm -hmm. that is now mm -hmm. happening globally. The reality, it is not it is not a reality show, it's not a game show. Trump is real. Mm. We can and we can see the rise of different individual uh, uh, fascist extreme right wing movements in in Europe as well. But also, as you say, more broadly, austerity, uh, environmental issues on which a lot of these people mm. stood. So I feel that it is precisely because it is a moment of crisis. Uh, an, an epochal moment of crisis um, that 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 Corbyn stands in relation to Attlee, not talking about personality, but in relation to that moment. This first discussion is to sort of set the scene for the weekend. It's Attlee then and now. What are the similarities and the differences between the Attlee era and now? And maybe have we come full circle? When it dawned on me that the insults that were that um, mm. uh, Clement Attlee was uh, got was just the same as Corbyn was getting, you know, it takes courage and determination to be a Labour Party leader. Enemies before you, enemies behind you, disparage your appearance. They sneer at your policies. They patronise you. You've got no talent. You're too ordinary, and you're too old. And was that? Well, that was Attlee. That was that was some of the insults that Attlee got, and it's the same sort of thing now that that. Um, Jeremy was getting um, before you know uh, he came good and it's oh Jeremy now um, but the, the other thing that struck me was that the country is more unequal now than it was ever since the 1930s I mean you've got to go back to the 1930s to realize the kind of poverty um, that, that was there in the 20s and 30s that so appalled uh, Attlee and, and uh, some of his friends um, we've gone back to that now. Okay, it's not quite the same the same level of poverty. You know, kids have more or less got shoes. What are we doing with food banks in in the in the present time? What are we doing with homeless people? Um, so, you know, a whole of the things that that in that manifesto and that Attlee was was building, um, Corbyn is actually promising now. You know, he's not promising austerity, except he is promising to raise taxes. He's practicing, you know, lifting the public pay service gap, higher levels of spending, particularly on housing, um, rent controls, absolutely crucial, you know. I mean, <coughs> well, yeah. Ken, you you did the, the definitive, you know, Ratman thing and Kathy come home. Um, what are yeah. we now? You know, look.
look at the way that, that our children have to pay these high rents, people have to pay. People cannot live now. They're living in fear, many people. And that's how they were in the 1930s. Um, so we've got to learn about Ackley and we've got to uh, contrast what was happening then to what's happening now and then say we can get out of this because we can. What was standing in Ackley's way? Could you? Um, I think there's two answers to that. One's expected and one's unexpected. Well, that, that I would yeah. give. The, the expected one is that he's standing against class interests. Um, clearly, the, um, those, <coughs> those who had power didn't want to give it up or give, a, give up any, any element of it. Um, and it's what would face Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party now is, um, well, we've had a taste of it in the, in the decades since the, um, since the Second World War. I mean, he'd stand against international capital the International Monetary Fund, uh, the World Bank, uh, the European Union, um, the American CIA. Um, I mean, if he made serious inroads into mm. the power of capital, think what they did to Allende. Mm. They don't take prisoners and they're not joking. So the, he would have the might of international capital against him, represented through the BBC, mm. or yes. represented through our independent media. Obviously, you've got the attack dogs in the Mail and Express and Murdoch Press and so on. But he would have, and they operate in, as we know, in a kind of subterranean way with abuse and so on. Uh, but he'd have, the, he'd have the might of the power of capital. We've reached a stage, I think, where capitalism is now, it's so dependent on extreme exploitation that you think of now the precarious worker and of which there are hundreds of thousands, millions, whose labour can be turned on and off like a tap, who have no trade union, by and large, <coughs> they're so-called self-employed, they will... Um, I was talking to some care workers the other day, uh, two, a couple of days ago, um, they work... They'll have to do a shift, say an eight-hour shift. There may be some care workers here, who may well be. Um, and the one, ones I was talking to, this is in Scotland, <coughs> they might get four or five jobs in that time. The downtime is not paid. Most of them depend on public transport. They are stuck in one place. Two hours later, they've got to be somewhere else, maybe for a 15-minute job or 15, 45 minutes. They get paid for those minutes. The wage, the hourly rate is £8.50, I think I was told. If they go to do a 15-minute care work with someone, they will get £2.50. They might have been waiting and travelling for an hour beforehand and have an hour afterwards. Now, that's the level of exploitation that people work And there's many examples and many others. John MacDonald, this year, vowed that Labour's goal would be to transform capitalism with consequences far more reaching than the Acme government's establishment of the welfare state and the NHS. He said the aims of a Corbyn government would be to, in the life of one parliament, lay the foundations of a new society that is radically fairer, more equal and more democratic. Too many governments in the past, and not just this current one, uh, thought that government should only intervene when something goes wrong. He said, we believe that government intervention should be there <coughs> to make sure things go right. When we return to government, we must aspire to be another great reforming administration. I want us to surpass even the Atlee government for radical reform. The situation demands nothing less. Simply undoing the damage inflicted by David Cameron and George Osborne will be a huge task, <coughs> but we should ha aim even higher than this. And time and time again, from 45 onwards, people saying we can't afford to do this, we can't afford to do that, and yet they did. Yeah. They, um, and that's one of the, you know, the, the, the big myths that we need to overcome now. And I don't think for a second that John MacDonald buys into this myth, we can't mm -hmm. afford to do this. Mm -hmm. Actually, we cannot afford not to do it. Yeah. We must yes. go ahead. Okay, what's the path to public ownership? What does that look like? And kind of dig into some of these questions and talk to people in lots of different sectors about how it could work in practice. So... Because, because actually, you know, possibly an element of, of what has sometimes been missing in the past is to have that real public involvement and that real sense of public involvement. And so, for example, I'm, I'm doing um, a response to a new statesman piece at the moment, and, one, and their, their criticisms, I can't remember the 
who the guy is, I've forgotten, Gregory, someone. Anyway, they said British Rail was underinvested in, and that was their main criticism. So that's absolutely right. How do we make sure that it's properly invested in? And how do we make sure that the investment is for you know, new green technology? And how do we make the public feel part of that and passengers feel part of that? It's all completely possible, but we need to have a conversation about it. Ultimately, the, the conversation we're having, whether it be in the economy, whether it be in the media, it's about democracy. And it's about neoliberalism being a system that is completely against democracy, that closes spaces, that closes participation, that privatizes <coughs> profits, that socializes debt, that mm. enforces violence against new vision, social democracy, you want to call it, you can call it socialism, that seeks to open up participation, uh, a plurality of voices, uh, and, and now obviously with the technology we have the chance and the ability to improve on, on some of the systems that have been created in the past in the name of socialism, and I think that's the challenge that we have. I was fortunate enough to study economics at the School of Oriental and African Studies in, you know, I graduated in 2000, a kind of dissident space of economics, probably in the world, in the, you know, <laughs> but certainly inside job, you know, you've had economic students around the world come together to protest mm -hmm. the economics, and I understand, I've done courses at the LSE where you have the future Chicago boys, mm -hmm. future Latin American finance, and literally they're indoctrinated mm -hmm. by a, um, which if you study it, it's absolutely ludicrous. If you study, I would say the most revolutionary thing we could do is to teach neoliberalism theory to everyone through political education. Because the theory is absolutely ludicrous. You have to think, you have to believe a set of assumptions which have no basis in the real world. And so anyone that understands what neoliberalism means in theory knows that in practice it's a fraud. So I think that's, you know. And, and this has been a really long time coming. I mean, I don't know if you've already talked about the Montpellier Society, but, mm. but you know, as soon as the NHS was created, there was this group of right-wing economists who thought, how can we get back the agenda? You know, how, how can we do that? How can we reclaim the agenda on behalf of neoliberalism? And that was back in 1947, I think they met for the first time. Um, and then they obviously created think tanks across the world, and they used those think tanks, which had money to promote their ideas, um, you know, to the point where, where we are today, where, where we've been indoctrinated with this stuff that is clearly ridiculous, like the idea that the private sector is somehow inherently more efficient. And it's just not true, and we, we pay more in various ways when we privatise. <coughs> but but we've, we've got all those mantras in our heads that have been, you know, born to that brainwash, yeah. If you were to read the 1945 manifesto, it would really make Jeremy Corbyn look like a Lib Dem. <laughs> kind of, almost, really. That's how far the goalposts have been moved. They, of course, understand that. So, just one by one, how, how frightening are they to the other side? I think we can put a figure of it, 14 pages, that's how much uh, the Daily Mail published in June. <laughs> um, and, um, it's very frightening indeed because um, they know that the ideas that were being promoted by von Hayek and Friedman when they met in Montpellier, those ideas are now utterly discredited. The entire intellectual underpinning of economic conservatism or economic liberalism or the Chicago Boys or whatever you want to call it, I'm an ex-LSE, so LSE is poison and they haven't moved on, it's gone. I would like to promote in you know, two weeks time in Edinburgh there'll be a uh, meeting of the International Network of New Economic Thinking and you know, a lot of young people are, are, have rejected entirely the, the underpinnings of economic yes. thinking in most of our, our, our faculties in Britain. Um, so things are moving on fast. Um, but I think it's very frightening indeed, above all, to the city interests, because um, uh, Brexit, they weren't expecting Brexit. And Brexit has opened up a complete can of worms. I'm happy to talk about that at length in the Q&A if you want to go down that route. But I think the answer is very threatening indeed. Hmm. Very <coughs> embarrassingly, shamingly for me, very late in the day. I was trained as a social worker in the 1980s. Never heard any mention of Clement Attlee being a social worker. Then you mentioned I wrote a book on mm -hmm. social work and social policy, and I was doing some, I was, it was when I was writing that book, and I was doing research about it, and I came across an article with a reference, Attlee, CR, 1920, was a social worker. I remember, th I remember thinking, surely not. <laughs> not that Attlee, CR, 1920. So 
but yes, it was. And so then I went around and I managed to track the book down. But I remember, I remember going into work and going down my corridor, saying to people, "Did you know that Cammy Tandy was a social worker?" <laughs> and there was well, one said yes, others all said no, including one person who's actually trained at LSE. <laughs> so <coughs> this has been a forgotten bit of social yeah. work's history. Yeah. And so <coughs> I, I, I remember vowing that day, <laughs> so then, you know, I'm going to get this out known because. Everyone knows the sort of the press that social workers get sometimes, <laughs> and uh, the sort of knocking we get. And uh, you think anything that can give social workers a bit of pride, yeah. you know, what it's a common feeling. Yeah. I, I talk to people and I talk to social workers, and everyone says to me, you know, Jonathan, it's when people, when I'm at a party or something, and someone says to me, well, what do you do? And my heart sinks to my boots. <laughs> <laughs> and I want people to say, I'm a social worker. And I'm thinking, if people can think, actually, Clement Attlee was a yeah. social worker, that might help them say, and I'm a, good a social worker. On the uh, right side. On the right. If you brought Attlee back now, what do I think would be the one thing that would make him angry, would make mm -hmm. him cry? Food bank. Mm -hmm. Food bank mm -hmm. in Britain in 2017. Mm -hmm. And and some politicians who say they're all scrounges, it encourages mm -hmm. people to scrounge. Mm -hmm. Well, Attlee would have known that debate. Mm -hmm. And some politicians who say they're rather uplifting. <laughs> <laughs> do you hear, do you hear uh, a politician with a bit of a Victorian throwback saying that the other day? Oh Rhys Mogg. Yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah, uplifting. Yeah. How can you say yeah. that a food bank is uplifting? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was just, just the sort of approach that Attlee was yeah, arguing against so yeah. strongly. So you're able to say to your students now that, because I've been saying all weekend, polls of historians, political scientists, Clement Attlee was the 20th century's greatest prime minister. Well, yeah, yeah. Was a social worker. And he was a social worker. And wrote about it. Wrote about and it. Gave and gave it a huge amount of headspace. And did it. Yeah. Not just wrote about it, he did it. Yeah. He learned from it. It changed his life. And he went on and changed the country. Yeah. And if you want to be proud to be a social worker, yeah. remember that. Mm -hmm. Francis Beckett, who's the author of the book from which all these words are taken. It's a fabulous biography called Clem Attlee, Labour's Great Reformer. And brilliant Adjua Ando. I could read all night biographies, I'm not going to. Adjua, Richard Attlee, who is one of Clement Attlee's grandsons, actor, Kiko Markham, and Jeremy Hardy. And Francis will kick off with the narration. Enjoy. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> teeming fetid mess of buildings and misery in the east end of London at the turn of the century, when thousands of men, women and children were herded together like ill-treated animals in their own filth at the end of Queen Victoria's long reign, was described in a pamphlet called The Bitter Cry of Outcast London. Published in 1883, it was written by the Reverend Andrew Mearns of the Evangelical Church. He wrote, while we have been building our churches and solacing ourselves with our religion, and dreaming that the millennium was coming, the poor have been growing poorer, the wretched more miserable, the immoral more corrupt. He concluded, as Clement Attlee concluded three decades later, after working in the same part of the East End as Mr. Mears, that, quote, without state interference, nothing effectual can be accomplished upon any large scale. Few had boots, and their clothes were just rags. Many a time I've washed their cold, sore feet in winter, he had come a long way from the laconic remark he made to Lawrence as they travelled back to Putney after their first visit. It was a good show, that. Might look in from time to time. In one of his earliest poems, he wrote of what he felt for Limehouse. In Limehouse, in Limehouse, before the break of day, I hear the feet of many men who go upon their way, who wander through the city, the grey and cruel city, through streets that have no pity, the streets where men decay. In Limehouse, in Limehouse, by night as well as day, 
I hear the feet of children that go to work or play, of children born to sorrow, the workers of tomorrow. How shall they work tomorrow, who get no bread today? In Limehouse, in Limehouse, today and every day, I see the weary mothers who sweat their souls away, poor, tired mothers trying to hush the feeble crying of little babies dying for want of bread today. In Limehouse, in Limehouse, I'm dreaming of the day when evil times shall perish and be driven clean away, when father, child and mother shall live and love each other, and brother help his brother in happy work and play. Devon has been attacked for failing to cost the NHS in the long term with any accuracy. The figures in his plan, as he freely admitted, were little more than educated guesses, and they proved optimistic. Was all this not the grossest sort of complacency, saddling the nation with such liabilities? Ackley gave his answer to the House of Commons in 1946. The question is asked, can we afford it? Supposing the answer is no, what does that mean? It really means that the sum total of the goods produced and the services rendered by the people of this country is not sufficient to provide for all our people at all times in sickness, in health, in youth, and in age, the very modest standard of life that is represented by the sums of money set out in the second schedule to this national insurance bill. I cannot believe that our national productivity is so slow, that our willingness to work is so feeble, or that we can submit to the world that the masses of our people must be condemned to penury. It is, of course, all a matter of priorities. You cannot have a universal welfare state and low taxes. And the voters knew that in 1945, because Ackley and his ministers told them so. Governments since then have tended to blur this harsh truth. At the time of the 1951 Labour election defeat, Atlas' sister Margaret had written to Tom, lamenting the results. <coughs> Tom wrote to her, I don't think we should be too disconcerted by the result of the general election. Don't you think that after a revolution such as been worked in the last six and a half years, there is bound to be a reaction? The benefits of the revolution are taken for granted. The implications of the working out of its imperfections is taken to heart. As far as Clem is concerned, his work is safe. A bit of the backbone of history. Looking back to our old Christian social union days, did we ever dare to hope that we should get right into the promised land in our lifetime? That it should have been done with Clem as Prime Minister makes me give thanks every time I think of it. It indicated that Tom understood, whether Clem did or not, the revolutionary nature of the Atlee government. This is the first of our Atlee Nation project. It's just started this weekend, we're going to continue, so hopefully we'll see you all again at some point in the future. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.